welcome um, to our final Murdoch's Mixology for this year. Um, we have the amazing Ed Carpenter who's uh, joining us. And hello to Zoom land, and we have Murdoch people here in the room too in the Farha Great Hall. Um, so I hope, I, I chatted with a good number, um, not everybody, but a nice number of people are gonna recall Ed Carpenter for, from our adventurous night when we bust out to the Eisenhower Airport before it was even open. Ed was toward the end of, but still putting finishing touches on his fabulous um, sculpture out there. He created, it's, he's, he's titled it Aloft, it's that immense sculpture that graces the entry in the lobby um, to our airport. And I would say that it's this perfect statement that um, greets particularly all of us, but particularly visitors who come to Wichita for the first time. And it signals to people that the arts are well and alive um, in Wichita. We're a happening place where the arts flourish. So Ed Carpenter is based in Portland, Oregon, and he's, he's jo joining us through the magic of uh, Zoom this evening. But his practice is absolutely worldwide. He specializes in very large scale sculpture. And I would say um, projects really of architectural scale and in glass. And it's fascinating to me that overall his training is in glass design and technique. Let, um, and, and this was training that he acquired both in Germany and England and the United States. And we see his training and I would say just astounding innovation that this man has applied over an amazing career to glass and lighting. Um, he is the recipient of numerous high honors. Um, including two National Endowment for the Arts Artist Grants and awards from such organizations as the American Institute of Architects and the Americans for the Arts. His commissions have been here, there, and everywhere. I mentioned his practice is really worldwide, from Belfast to Taiwan, a key to Japan to Chicago. In the United States, he has his landscape all across the country, from Los Angeles to Seattle and Dallas and New York, and of course now Wichita. Um, he's created great public artworks in airports, not only in our city, but in such cities as Miami, Houston, Raleigh, Durham, Phoenix, Las Vegas, Portland. But what has been keeping Ed busy since 2015 <laughs> when our airport opened and he completed that wonderful sculpture? That's what we're going to find out tonight. That's what we've invited him to present. I'm really pleased. I don't, oh, there he is. I see him um, now on Zoom. Ed, we, we just so admire your work that you've created for us here in Wichita, and we're eager to find out how you've made other cities, too, excited about your artwork and what you've been up to. So um, by the magic of uh, a carpet ride, we, we are connecting to you in Portland, Oregon. So please take it away, Ed. Well, from the sound of the, um, the background sounds from your party there at the museum that I've been listening to for the last five or 10 minutes, I think you're a little bit ahead of me on the cocktails. I, th I suppose that may, may make you an easy audience, which I appreciate. I'm sorry I couldn't be there uh, in person with you. That would have been a pleasure, but um, it's uh, an equal pleasure to get to present to you tonight. And I'm, as Patricia said, I will be showing you work from the last uh, whatever it's been since I worked in Wichita, uh, seven or eight or nine years. Um, and um, I'm, I'm gonna be uh, taking off from the theme that various lectures you have had uh, have uh, sprung from. Uh, I understand from Patricia that you've had several lectures on the subject of the shift to large scale for contemporary glass art. And um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what happens uh, to how you can use glass as the scale increases, because uh, you may know that glass has some strengths and some weaknesses. And uh, although it is 10 times stronger than concrete in compression, it's not very strong in tension. 
And so uh, in order to make a really big sculpture that includes glass, uh, it's hard to use the glass in a structural way without having it become extremely massive, expensive, heavy, and so on. So um, the, the other thing that I'm gonna talk about is how each of my commissions is derived very specifically from its own context, the physical context and the um, emotional context of each site. So I hope you will uh, understand that clearly from my illustrations and the comments that accompany them. Um, I understand we'll have time afterwards for some discussion. I'm happy to stick around for that. Uh, that's always enjoyable. So let me uh, share the screen. So I'm starting with um, a picture of some trees because I think they are exemplary of what I'm gonna talk about, about how as scale increases, the role of glass changes. And that is um, the trunk obviously is very strong and it can get up to you know, 100, 200, 500 feet uh, tall um, because it's strong both in compression and in tension. Um, as uh, glass, as sculpture gets really big, it takes on a role more like the leaves than like the trun uh, trunk and the branches. Um, and you'll see that as we proceed. So I'm gonna start in Mesa, Arizona. I've collected up some postcards from each location. And uh, I uh, was lucky enough to get to work on their light rail line, which you see a part of here. This is not a sculpture. These are the uh, shade canopies, but they illustrate some of the difficulties of designing for uh, a light rail station. And that is, there are constraints overhead and uh, underfoot that there are very narrow um, possibilities at the ground level. And then you get up higher and you've got uh, wires and all kinds of things. So uh, that, that makes an interesting constraint. So of course, Arizona um, has beautiful plant life. And since I'm frequently um, using botanical imagery uh, as starting points, um, this is one of many images that influenced me in designing for this particular site in Mesa. Um, and as usual, I start with hand sketching. I never start on the computer. I find it's much uh, faster and um, better in every way to do hand sketching. Eventually, you'll see uh, plenty of com computer images. So uh, like this. So this illustrates some of the possibilities and some of the constraints. There's bright sun in Arizona, of course, and so uh, a lot of ways to play with glass. And um, you'll see here that there's a steel structure and that the glass, although there's a lot of glass, it's not doing the work. Uh, it's doing the aesthetic work, but not the structural work. And uh, a shot from the fabrication shop, uh, constructing the stainless steel armature and the kind of detailing that is necessary, of course, in a light rail station, um, the work is seen from a great distance and it's seen from very close. You can walk right up to it and touch it. And so that's an opportunity and it's a challenge. So here's, this is actually a different station than the one that I showed you originally, but you, you can get an idea of how I was trying to get up high between the uh, electrifying wires and um, to make an icon that people would recognize as they approach their own station and, oh, I'm home now. And um, it's suggestive of the desert uh, flora, but not um, any kind of uh, strict representation. So it's special kind of glass laminated uh, between layers of tempered safety glass that um, looks different in different lights, obviously. And um, so it, it shows why use glass <laughs> on a large scale. It, it's, it has a mercurial changing reflective and transmittive capability that other materials just don't have. And you'll see some projects of mine coming up later where I didn't use any glass. It's not always called for. Um, but when it is, it, it can do things that other materials simply can't do. Uh, 
obviously one of the things you have to do is to try to keep um, climbing to a minimum and to keep people from, from being able to reach the glass. The glass is very tough, laminated safety glass, but it could be broken. And so the, the sculpture uh, developed um, in, re in uh, response to those kinds of constraints, as well as um, certain kind of aesthetic expression that I was going for. So now we're in Lincoln, Nebraska. I'm sorry if these postcards are a little fuzzy. When you get things off the internet, they're not always very high res, but um, I, I had a wonderful opportunity um, after a long competitive process and, and a lot of political wrangling to get to design a, uh, and build a sculpture for the foreground of their arena um, in downtown uh, Lincoln. And um, this is quite a, quite a lump of a building <laughs> and it's got very nice materials and it's a, a, a wonderful building in many ways with this beautiful balcony up above um, and views toward it from different parts of the city. But how do you do something that's in scale with such a, a big, massive building um, and that uh, encourages rather than inhibits pedestrian use and all kinds of other things It works 24 hours a day. Um, and so I enjoyed working on all those problems. And uh, these are some of the influences. There is a ra old railroad canopy um, adjacent which has these beautiful old rusting steel forms that were suggestive to me. And you'll see some of these other forms that uh, are obvious once you see the sculpture. So I wanted the sculpture to be very transparent, but big. Um, I wanted it to be 60 feet tall, but not to be a big lump like the building. Um, and so it's made of slender, uh, I can't remember how many, like about 60 or so, um, 50 or 60 slender stainless steel poles, uh, pipes, um, highly polished, uh, 60 feet tall. And, but they can't stand up by themselves. So you'll see that there is um, an interior network of cables crisscrossing that um, actually hold, holds the sculpture up. And it gives a, a level of detail that um, makes a kind of layering up to the sculpture that I find pleasing. But it also gives an opportunity to um, augment the sculpture with glass. Uh, it gives a place to put the glass. And um, so there are hundreds of pieces of glass here um, that are arranged on those cables. So this is in the fabrication shop in um, Omaha. Uh, the same shop that built some of the other projects that I'll show you. Um, and you can see the quality of the work. And here you get an idea of the scale of the piece. And here, loading it, offloading it at the site. This is the last of, I think, 12 sections that uh, make up the outer framework of the sculpture. And lifting that last section into place and the interior crisscrossing cables um, shining in the, in the light. And the sculpture is lighted by um, both in the interior and around the perimeter of the exterior. And here's a shot showing the manufacturing of the glass in Taiwan. I had recently done a project in Taiwan, which you will see shortly, and made connections uh, through that project for the glass. And um, so I used it, uh, that same fabricator again uh, for the Lincoln project. And here we are installing the glass uh, with very strong engineered clips. Everything of course is engineered for um, severe winds plus uh, two or three inches of ice. And it's rare to get that combination of conditions but that's what we have to engineer for. So you can understand why the glass itself has to be used very carefully because it can't resist those kinds of loads by itself. Broken up into these relatively small pieces, each of which is as an engineered attachment system, um, we can use it at this scale and have it survive those kinds of uh, natural events. But um, it certainly couldn't do the work of holding the sculpture up by itself.
obviously as the sun comes through it uh, does a kind of a sundial thing wonderfully interactive people love to um, play especially kids with the uh, lighting on the pavement as it moves slowly around the sculpture during a sunny day and at night the you can see the perimeter lights around the outside and there's an equal number of lights on the inside of the sculpture and uh, they're programmed um, uh, in about a 15 or 20 minute sequence uh, that's relatively subtle most of the time and then it speeds up and gets more exciting and uh, uh, it was an interesting thing to program the lighting um, to try to have it have some placid moods but also um, exhibit some of the excitement that um, that the events held within the building uh, contain. And this was at the grand opening. Um, and so you can see how crowded the plaza sometimes becomes. So now we're moving to that project that I mentioned in Taiwan. If you've been to Taiwan, you know that Taipei is up in the north. Hey, friend Ed. Hey, friend Ed. I'm just going to interrupt for a minute because Please. I don't, you know, we have a microphone up here at the podium, and you're not hearing all the oohs and the ahs and the oh my gosh. and going on you know that's one of the deficits of zoom but just so that you know you've got a crowd that's ooing and aahing here okay well I, I appreciate that thank you very much anyway if you've been to taiwan you know that taipei which you've heard of if you haven't been there is in the north and in the south is uh uh taishong or, or gaoshong and in this in the center of the uh island is uh taishong and that's where I worked. And um, you can see that the people in Taishung um, have, a, have a, a very positive feeling about their city. And um, this is where um, I ended up working. It was a competition, an international competition, like the competitions which um, have resulted in the construction of various buildings around this site. Uh, what you're seeing here are crisscrossing parks, a planned view of crisscrossing parks with parking underneath all of them in uh, major city buildings all around. On the far right is their, um, is their opera house designed by Toyo Ito. And then there's on the top and the bottom, there are major civic office buildings and the rest of the infill is, is housing and other kinds of offices. The red circle in the middle represents the site that um, the competition uh, was about, which you see here. And um, as I said, there's parking underneath all of this. And in the very center of this park, right where the two parks cross at the cross axis with the city hall in the background is um, a spiral stair or a spiral ramp that goes down three levels of parking. And there was an international competition. Uh, I was asked by an art consultant in um, Taipei to join. I uh, eagerly did so and um, was asked to submit a, a very rough scheme in the beginning. And um, so I, um, and, and I should say that the competition was for um, a sculpture to sit on the viewing platform, which you can barely make out in the center of this spiral ramp. Um, it, that didn't seem like a great idea to me. It seemed as if, if you put a sculpture on the viewing platform, it's gonna clog it up and, 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 and ruin its uh, capability to uh, be a place for people. So my scheme was to surround it and go all the way to the bottom down to the third level of parking and then up another uh, 40 or 50 feet. And here's the sketch that I submitted um, just as a concept asking the art consultant whether they thought this would fly. And um, indeed, I ended up uh, presenting this scheme which as I developed it started reminding me of the crocus flower. Um, as you know, crocus is the first flower to come up in the spring, frequently uh, through snow. And it, it was an apt symbol for the emergence of uh, Taishung itself as a major city in Taiwan and indeed in the world. Uh, when my brother-in-law studied there uh, in the mm, 60s, there were two paved streets. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's quite a different place.
So um, we're jumping from my computer uh, images uh, all the way to installing the glass in the sculpture, which is again, uh, stainless steel. Um, in this case, 316 stainless because it's a marine environment. Um, it rains a lot there. They also have a lot of earthquakes. They have earthquakes every 20 minutes or so. And um, so it has to be very strongly engineered. Uh, we were invited to lunch at an apartment in an adjoining building. So I got to take this picture, which is pleasing and uh, a closer shot. So here you can see how it composes nicely against the uh, very dark glass of the city hall building and how it really is a center point for the entire city. And once again, the glass is playing a role of reinforcing the forms of the structure and the structure itself is meant, meant to be expressive um, and not just uh, something that, not just an armature, but uh, inextricably bound up in the aesthetics of the sculpture. And as, as night comes on, the lights come on and you begin to get quite a different effect. Um, and of course, night lighting you'll see in all of these projects is very important. So we're jumping now to Texas and uh, I'll show you a couple of projects in Texas. Um, but this one is a, is a challenging site, 14 lanes of freeway and frontage road uh, go by Richardson, Texas. And uh, Richardson, Texas um, is the site, I believe where Hewlett Packard was started or one of those one of those big tech places, and it has grown as a tech center. And um, this is uh, the red circle is at the entrance to the city. You don't see most of the city here, but they're very proud of their identity. And I was asked in the competition uh, which I won to consider these uh, these requirements that, uh, contribute to the overall look, feel, and image of Richardson create a gateway to the telecom corridor uh, and capture Richardson's spirit as a place that is smart and inventive um, and be a visible, visible icon for motorists, dark passengers. There's a train that goes right by cyclists and pedestrians. So once again, it has to work uh, on various scales on uh, uh, the big urban scale, as well as uh, the intimate human scale. And you'll see that you can walk right up to the sculpture. So, uh, this obviously is a high-tech image, the most fundamental kind of um, digital metaphor springs from this, and you'll see an echo of it in the sculpture itself. So uh, one of the requirements was to make it big. Of course, these projects always have fixed budgets. How do you make it big enough to address this 14 lanes of freeway and frontage road and, and a train line? Um, with this fixed budget. Um, and the only way that I knew of to get big, that big, was to do a cable stayed structure. Because then the cables, which are relatively inexpensive, are doing all the work. And you have a, a modest, a more modest structure uh, than you would have if you were cantilevered out of the ground. Um, so I began to design the structure that you see here, which, uh, it goes up as high as I figured I could, I could afford to go. It goes 70 feet um, and it comes down to a point which is um, eight inches wide. And so there's a kind of ballerina effect to it that I like. And um, unlike the Lincoln sculpture, which has the cables on the inside of the structure, this one has cables on the outside of the structure, but doing something rather similar. They're crisscrossing, which provides lateral stability to the uh, structure. And it also gives me a way to make a skin that has all the magic of glass. So modeling it into the site. All right, Ed, I'm stopping you because the, the room is sort of a buzz with, it's 70 feet tall and it comes down to something that, did you tell us eight inches wide? Eight, eight inches, yes, eight inches. But, but, what? But, what? But, but of course the cables, you know, the cables are spreading out uh, 30 feet or 40 feet. 
across. There are three sets of three cables. So you could say that the, I mean, the structure is really as wide as the anchors of the cables. That, and, and of course the cables are how you get away with it. Um, but uh, if, if you think this is something, hang on and I'm gonna show you up in a minute, a 90 foot wide sculpture, 20 feet high, that comes down to an inch and a half point. <laughs> so this, this ain't nothing. <laughs> but please, please do interrupt me with questions, Patricia, as we go on, I like it. Okay, so down to an eight inch point. Uh, here we are building it again in Omaha, same place that built the, the uh, Lincoln sculpture. And you can see it's quite a structure. And uh, putting it up, it was interesting to, to find uh, erectors for this, your conventional steel erectors. Um, I was uh, concerned about because they're uh, a little more rough handed than uh, the people that I eventually found. And I, I realized that the people I need to put this up are people who put up communications towers. And I, I, I found a wonderful firm called East Tex Tower out of Longview, Texas, that puts up towers typically 500 feet high. So this little 70 footer is nothing for them. And, and they also just erected the project in Dallas that I'll show you in a minute that comes down to the inch and a half point. But I love the um, installation process. Here, here you see a train going by as we're um, installing cables. Uh, the guy, both guys are using a cable tensioning device um, to check the tension. Obviously the cables have to be tensioned properly before we can put the glass on. And here we're starting to put the glass on again with engineered fastening techniques um, and moving up the sculpture. Now you can see different backgrounds create different looks in the glass, similar glass to what I um, used in Lincoln, also uh, fabricated by the same company in Taiwan. So you can see the obvious uh, ones and zeros digital kind of reference, um, uh, uh, reinforcing the uh, telecom sort of metaphor. And I was lucky enough, both and both times I've installed in Texas recently to be there during a full moon, um, moon uh, on the other project here shortly also. And once again, uh, beautiful projections uh, and reflections from the sculpture. There you can see that how it comes down to that eight inch point. And uh, the, although the basic structure above this 12 foot level is all galvanized steel, the, up from the ground level up to uh, that ring that you see there is all stainless steel uh, to, to give it a kind of attractiveness at the, at the um, at the pedestrian level that it needs. So um, with the, with the, with the um, freeway in the background and differing skies, you can see how it changes color. The lights are all just white light, but depending upon what's happening in the background and where the sun is and so on, you get very different looks to the sculpture. Oh my goodness, Ed, that's amazing. And, uh, Somebody just gave me a microphone. I'm, I think that was probably a mistake. But. <laughs> yeah, well, you can you can uh, translate. That's, that'll be fine. And um, so uh, I, I really like the um, the way the the forms of the cables complement the forms in the sculpture. Um, they're very very intentionally designed to uh, make a whole and not to be just something that holds it up. All right, we're gonna to jump to Portland now, uh, where I live. And I'm gonna show you a project that doesn't have any glass at all because it doesn't need any and you'll see why. This red line is the Wildwood Trail, which is about 30 miles long. And it runs through a park uh, on the west side of Portland, which is also about 30 miles long called uh, Forest Park. Uh, we're really lucky to have such uh, proximity to nature here in Portland and that, uh, trail is only crossed by roads in about four or five places. The busiest of those roads is the one that you'll see shortly. And But the character of the trail is like what you see here. It's very, there's a lot of solitude there uh, if you're in the right part of the trail on the right day. 
It's a runner's mecca. Um, people come from all over the world to train or compete um, in uh, track and field and uh, long distance running events. Of course, Nike is nearby. And so this trail is, is a mecca for those people. But where the trail crosses West Burnside, which is three lanes of curving uh, traffic that is posted at 35 and everybody's going 55, you can see that's a bit of a problem. And for years and years, people have wanted to have a bridge there. And um, so in response to the talk of a bridge and the impetus of a friend of mine who was an architect who was involved with a group that was trying to get a bridge for this area and had done so unsuccessfully, I made a proposal uh, uh, about uh, six years ago for a bridge design that I worked on on spec with uh, my engineer partners. And um, these are the, the design parameters that I, objectives that I established for myself, that it provide a safe crossing for the trail over West Burnside, that it be a seamless experience for walkers and runners, that it fit the forest context, be minimally intrusive, be transparent and delicate, iconic and original, uh, be uh, able to be constructed and installed at a reasonable cost with offsite fabrication for quick erection and that it be easy to maintain. Well, that's a lot of things to have to achieve, but uh, as you'll see, we did it. Uh, me and a, about a thousand donors, as well as the city and, um, and Metro, which is the broader city uh, government agency. And um, although I was the one who promoted my design uh, through meetings with all the city councilors, the mayor, two different mayors, um, all of uh, community groups uh, for a number of years. And then finally, I convinced Portland Parks Foundation to take it on as a capital project. And together, we uh, got it funded and built. So um, this is the configuration. I wanted a curving deck from the beginning because I, I felt as if it really needed the lyricism of a curving deck. Um, and you can see uh, how it circumvents the part of the trail that had to cross West Burnside. So in order to make it economical and uh, transparent, as transparent as possible, I conceived it as a tricord truss. So the part of the sculpture that's doing the work is down here at the bottom, this triangle that the people are standing on, that's the truss. And the other members do some of the work, but not much. And it ended up being 10 feet wide, a little wider than what I'm showing here. Um, and you'll see that I was influenced by the uh, flora uh, once again. And uh, the design of the bridge may suggest to people the sword ferns that occur all along the 30 mile length of the trail or the vine maples or various other kinds of vegetation that are common in that area. So um, here's an early rendering um, and it eventually grew to have uh, more details and to have both painted and core tin rusting steel members. Uh, and we were able to design it with one column rather than the two that I originally uh, started on. And, and that makes it much nicer. Um, and you'll see as it progresses that there's no glass and that um, I, I thought a lot about whether it needed anything else, whether it be glass or anything. But I think you'll see that it, it does everything it needs to do uh, and is plenty lyrical without any glass. So it was a trick to deliver it because the fabrication shop was uh, a number of miles away and it's big. It came in three sections to the site and it had to take a roundabout route and then go through a tunnel, which is just up West Burnside. And it fit by about an inch on each side. Uh, it was really close. I wish I had a picture. Okay, a lot of laughter on fit on one inch on each side. You got to you got to hear that in. <laughs> well, yeah, it was tricky. Let me let me tell you, and uh, a very tricky site both to build on uh, steep slopes uh, that that sometimes have landslides. We had to have deep foundations, deep piles, um, and uh, just to get the crane in there, and we, uh, it was difficult. We had to close West Burnside for an entire weekend. It's a major arterial in and out of the west side of the city, and that caused all kinds of disruption. But uh, the people who live uh, on either side of this were really thrilled 
because they use this park and they use this trail all the time. And um, so they were willing to put up with some inconvenience. So an aerial view from a drone um, after it was finished. And uh, I like this shot. I had to crawl through the bushes quite a ways and uh, risk my life on, on the edge of a cliff in order to take this picture. But it gives a sense of how it really does uh, come out of and disappear back into a dense forest. So uh, one of the tricks with infrastructure like this, and I've done a number of bridges, is to do them in some kind of a budget that a city can afford. Um, people are, cities are used to building bridges for 50, 75, $100 a square foot. And so to do one that's uh, expressive at all, and of course my objective is to make the structure itself be expressive, not stick art onto a bridge. Um, and that's a very important distinction. Um, and, but in order to do that with an, in a budget that people can afford, um, that's, that's not easy. And so using simple materials like welded steel um, is, is a way to do it. And as I said, we had a thousand private donors, um, a big campaign, citywide campaign, um, and the, the city itself kicked in a bunch of money and so did Metro. So it's been really well received. Um, in the uh, year or two leading up to the installation of the bridge, the uh, trail crossings uh, as counted by uh, uh, an electronic battery operated counter that was attached to a tree next to the trail, the crossings went from 400 a week to 2000 a week um, in, in, the, in the month after the um, bridge was um, installed. Uh, the donors are recognized at the North end in this circle. You can't see the etched in names, but of course we, we couldn't uh, put in the names of a thousand different donors, but um, all the biggest donors got their name on there and uh, everyone else was thanked heartily. So, okay, now I'm gonna show you relatively quickly uh, my COVID playthings. I've been building these sculptures uh, during lockdown in my wood shop at home. And uh, they're made from uh, Douglas fir, uh, cut and milled on my own property. I live on 25 acres, 50 miles west of Portland in the Coast Range Mountains on a beautiful river, the Wilson River. And um, these things are about nine feet long and five or six feet wide. You can see several of them here. And of course, they don't have any glass, but um, this is not steam bent wood. It's all uh, just bent on the table held with blocks while I glue it into place. And uh, for me, they're, they're just drawings that I do in the material spontaneously without a sketch. So drawing in wood. And it's, it's been a very pleasing kind of um, uh, diversion uh, while I, when I couldn't do any traveling. And these are the first uncommissioned pieces I've done in about 40 years, and I, I'm, I'm continuing to make them. And um, I find it meditative and uh, really, really a great, um, a great pleasure to be using my hands other than with a pencil or waving my arms when other people are installing my giant sculptures. So you see a lot of the same kinds of forms here that uh, the bigger work contains. All right, enough of that. Um, now we jump to a town just south of Portland. I was, I, I rarely get to work in Oregon, uh, but I won a competition for an entrance piece for the city of Lake Oswego, which adjoins Portland to the south. Uh, it's quite a leafy place. And um, the, the citizens of Lake Oswego were asked about their city in a, in a uh, kind of a um, survey and hundreds of them replied and they talked about all kinds of things uh, that they had pride in with their city. But one of the main ones was um, that, they, that it was green and verdant and um, lush, and it had a sense of uh, growth 
natural growth and natural foliage that they love. So this is the site. It has some challenges. It has some big power lines going by that we weren't able to get um, rid of. It's a, it's a state highway, as well as being um, the main arterial into and out of Lake Oswego. Uh, there was that sign, welcome to Lake Oswego, right where this um, oval is. Um, that eventually was removed and, and a sculpture that also was removed. And these trees along the, the uh, edge of the road, uh, the deciduous trees there were removed as well to, to make a, a clearer site. Um, and that was run through the neighborhood groups and I was shocked to find that they were all delighted. They had seen pictures of the sculpture that I designed and um, they were willing to part with these trees um, in order to make a, a, this little park, pocket park into something that um, was more significant. So I started out sketching um, sort of leafy forms and then I started making them um, three dimensional. I did a lot of different schemes trying to figure out whether to do something singular or something episodic. And I realized pretty soon that I couldn't afford to do something big enough to be significant that was also episodic, that had a number of parts. So I brought the, those three sketches together into one piece and then it slowly became something else. Um, and uh, you'll see a, a bit of an evolution here. This is 25 feet high at this point and uh, stainless steel and glass. Um, uh, here we're bending and building the stainless steel armature, uh, installing it with a big crane on site, sort of overkill. It's not, the sculpture only weighs about 5,000 pounds. That crane is good for about 40,000, I think. Um, installing the glass and uh, a view down into the center of the sculpture from the lift that I was using to hand the glass to my longtime helper, Hans Hefker. Um, and uh, together we put the glass in at the very end so that it wouldn't be damaged. And, and uh, although this is laminated safety glass, once again, it's way up in the air uh, to minimize the possibility of uh, vandalism damaging it. And once again, you can see that it has a lot of different uh, colors and looks depending upon the background and the time of day. I had the luxury of being able to take some pictures from the lift while we had it uh, for the installation of the glass. So, and, and uh, I was really pleased with the night view. I'll have several shots here that shows, shows, shows you what it looks like at night. But once again, there are uh, up lights both inside the sculpture and just outside it in the foundation. And uh, looking up through the middle uh, at dusk, it, uh, it has uh, some wonderful colors. Uh, the fellow seated at the base of the sculpture is the electrician I was working with. He was aiming the lights while I stood back and tried to get it right. The first visitors, the first night, uh, they, were, they were quite pleased. I was glad to see that they stopped and oohed and awed once we turned the lights on. And uh, because I was worried that it wouldn't, that my budget for the sculpture couldn't make something significant enough to really be a gateway the way they had wanted and to be a suitable entry to the city, I designed a foreground for it and a background. So the red line curving behind the sculpture uh, is intended to be a stone wall, two feet high, immediately behind the sculpture, uh, descending to nothing, to zero on each of its wings. And then the foreground would be plantings like they have in other parts of the city of colorful flowers uh, designed to flower as much of the year as possible. Um, I was delighted that the city embraced this because it was uh, this, the site development was outside of my um, budget. And I worked with uh, the city landscaper and various other people from the Arts Commission and so on to uh, develop this. Unfortunately, we didn't raise the money for the wall behind it, but we're going to have a, uh, a boxwood hedge. You can see it. Um, laid out here. They're just starting to lay out 
all of this. And I think it's going to really make it look as if the sculpture was meant to be there uh, much more significantly than without it. All right, we're jumping back to Texas. And uh, this is the most recent project um, at Love Field. Uh, you've probably been to Dallas. You, you probably flew into DFW if you flew. Um, or if you were on Southwest, you might have come in uh, to Love Field. Uh, Southwest has, I think, 16 of the 18 gates at Love Field. So they kind of dominate the place. But it's so. We're Wichita's. We've been through Love Field. Okay, okay. of course you have. So, and, and uh, the people in Dallas like their small airport. Uh, you may have liked it too, going through it is, you know, of course, it doesn't have, have much to compete against, DFW being what it is. Um, in my opinion, one of the worst airports in the world. But um, anyway, uh, this is a, a more manageable scale and it has a distinctive design personality, kind of a mid-century design personality. And uh, also, uh, this red color uh, comes around all the time. Um, this is the site, which is at the end of one of their two big runways um, at the intersection of Herb Kelleher and Mockingbird, where you enter the air airport. On your right, if you're um, going up Herb Kelleher toward the airport, is the cell phone parking lot. On the left is the, um, the east end of one of the runways. And so it's really a cool site because it's completely open. Um, there's some landscaping design for this site. Um, and my sculpture is part of that project. Um, but the background is sky because of the airfield. And um, so I, I really relished uh, working on this and trying to figure out how to work with the interesting constraints. Because it's at the end of the runway, it can only be 20 feet tall by FAA regulation, but it needed to be really significant. So I started designing something which is 90 feet wide and 20 feet tall. And I wanted it to suggest, of course, flight. And uh, you don't have to look very far to learn that not only does Mockingbird Lane go right by there, but the Mockingbird is the state bird of the state of Texas. And it does some really interesting things. It does this thing called a wing display to attract its mates, mate, mates in, in the spring. And it flat, flaps its wings and you can see uh, videos of it on YouTube. It's quite amazing. And so I, uh, I was affected by those images and also images of advanced aircraft as I began to sketch, trying to figure out, well, what could I do that's uh, really wide, but not over 20 feet high? Uh, and slowly, these kinds of forms developed. And to me, as I was drawing them, they were suggesting uh, birds or advanced aircraft. And uh, here's a little more developed version of the computer model. Uh, you can see it's tilted uh, five degrees to the side to suggest uh, that it's either taking off or landing, uh, that it has alighted there or is about to go off. And um, uh, of course, the background is sky and runway. From some angles, it looks more like a flower. And well, how do you how do you hold up something that's ninety feet wide and comes to an inch and a half point? Well, obviously, once again with cables. And so the engineering was lots of fun. I worked with the the same engineers that I had worked with on some of these other projects, and uh, we had to really really uh, work hard to get the kind of delicacy that I was after and to carry the loads from where they originate down into that foundation to hold the thing up. And the foundation is, uh, because the soils are bad there, um, the, the piles go, uh, at, we were supposed to go 35 feet. We, we hit water around then and had to go another 10 or 15 feet, which wasn't great for the budget, but the thing is not gonna fall over. So a uh, building the sculpture again in Omaha uh, at Puritan Manufacturing, the same outfit that built two others that I showed you. And you can get a sense here that although it looks delicate from a distance, it's pretty massive um, and all made of stainless steel. And now installing it, there you see the inch and a half point. The electrical has to come up through that. You can see we're wrangling cables there. The wires are coming up through an access door that allows us to 
uh, connect to the interior lighting of the sculpture, all LED strip lights that you'll see shortly. And, and once again, there's also exterior lighting uh, cast into the concrete foundation. And the same guys who installed the tall tower for me in Richardson, which is only 12 miles up the road, um, came back from East X Tower and made short work of this. I was completely amazed they were able to install this basically in two days, um, but with very thorough preparation. And a lot of credit goes to the uh, people in Omaha who built it and did the shop drawings um, based on my engineer's drawings and figured out how to make the make it in segments that could be trucked to the site and relatively easily installed and bolted together. So here's an example of how I had thought I might use some glass in this and, and the tips are the obvious place. And you can see though that it wasn't necessary. And um, I had imagined that these tips would be uh, sheathed in glass and that there would be some sort of illumination on the inside. But it turned out that um, getting even lighting with a single source at the end of the red part of the wings was going to be really difficult. And then getting somebody to build the glass portion uh, was going to be expensive, tricky, dangerous, uh, uh, potentially not uh, weatherable, and so on and so forth. And so I ended up designing these tips, which you'll see a little closer uh, shortly, so that they would take um, uh, an LED rope light. And it, it turned out to be incredibly effective. And um, so once again, there's no glass. So this was just installed a month ago and the site work is ongoing. Um, and uh, I don't know that the power had to be brought in from the airfield itself, um, which is three quarters of a mile away. So it won't be illuminated at night until that happens. Um, there you can see the full moon on the left that I referred to earlier. That was a pleasant surprise. And you can see the perforated metal skin uh, painted red, but it's stainless steel that allows uh, the light to bounce around inside these wings and then come out, um, reflect out through all these holes and give um, a very strong presence at night. So there you some close-ups of those wing tips. And it's amazing how uh, minimal they are, but how much light they actually put out. All right, I'm gonna show you one last project, which is on the drawing board. Um, not, it's, the design was commissioned, but there's some question as to whether it'll ever get built for a variety of interesting urban reasons. Uh, but this uh, circle at the front of a big tall building, only the bottom of which you can see here um, is the site. And uh, uh, someone I've known for a long time in Portland, a, a wonderful real estate developer who cares a lot about the city, um, conceived with the neighbors for this building um, that they should uh, augment a number of fountains which are already in the area and create a kind of fountain district and that each of them would provide a fountain to help with that scheme. And so he asked me to design a fountain uh, to go in that traffic circle in front of his building. And the, the building is just black glass. And so uh, once again, I saw it as an opportunity to do something very delicate, um, but big. And uh, you'll see some similarity in the forms that I used here um, to that Dallas project that I just showed you. Um, so this is a section through the sculpture just showing how the, uh, the it would be like a big flower. Um, you know, the water would come up at the base and up through that central column and cascade down. And also the, the, uh, the stems of the flower are open on top and they would gather rain and carry it down into the pool um, during rainy weather, which we get a little bit of in Portland.
And this, this is designed to have glass, both attached to cables and on the tips of the, of the uh, slender elements. All right, we're back to the trees at the beginning. And uh, that's the end of uh, the illustrations. And maybe we can pull up uh, a view that allows me to see you and uh, be happy to chat for a while. while. Oh my goodness, Ed. Um, we have, okay, can, do you hear that applause? <laughs> We have, we have really quite the room. I underestimated the number of people who are here tonight. It's probably double what I told you earlier, Ed. And we've got a room that is largely occupied by people who are world-class themselves and do projects that span the world or impact and have resonance in the world. And we are happy to share the planet with you. Oh my goodness, those projects that you were doing are so incredibly impressive. Um, and I'm, so I say that, and now I'm going to start. Um, typically, I reserve my own questions just in case there are other questions, but I have so many questions, so I'm going to break my own rules and launch into a couple of things with you. Um, let me start just with, I, I think, a thought that's going through the room. Ed, how, lar how large was your staff pre-COVID? Um, my staff is one, one person. Um, and she has worked for me, uh, with me for 24 years. And uh, needless to say, she is in, in, an indispensable part of what I do. Arlene Doherty um, is, is my office manager, accountant, well, not accountant, but bookkeeper, uh, she helps me figure out um, how, what we're going to submit for different kinds of uh, submissions and all kinds of things like that. Um, everybody else is a consultant or a subcontractor. And clearly you've developed just amazing relationships over years to pull off these. Um, one of the, th as I was sitting in my chair, I was like, and this guy isn't an engineer, but you have some engineering friends, clearly. I do, and every project requires uh, serious engineering, and so I've picked up one or two things over the years. So the, another question I have, you didn't use the word diachronic, diachronic glass, but I think that is the technical term for the glass in particular that you used here with the Wichita airport that is... Um, also part of what we see in other projects. It, and even if the, the word isn't right, can, help us to understand what, what is the call, you know, what is the engineering behind this magical, mutable, changeable color glass that you use? Croic is the common word for it, dichroic, at meaning two colors. It, it actually has many colors. Um, it is created um, by depositing many microns thin layers of metallic oxides on either on glass itself or on an interlayer material, which is then bonded between layers of glass. And the light reflects off of or is transmitted through one or more of those layers uh, at a time, depending upon one's angle or the light source's angle to those layers. Um, and that accounts for the color shift, both in transmitted and in reflected light. So transmitted light, of course, is the light that passes through the glass and then transmits a projection onto another surface or, or not. The reflected light, uh, if you go back to your high school physics, uh, is reflected like a pool table uh, optics in a complementary angle, the uh, angle of incidence equals the angle of exit. Um, your pool ball does that off the cushion. Um, and that's the reflection. So sometimes what you're seeing with this glass is a reflection and sometimes you're seeing a transmission. And that depends a lot on what's behind it. If there's a dark background, you see reflection. If there's a light background, of course, the light is coming from somewhere and it goes right through the glass to your eye. That's transmission. Well, 
The reflected color is the complement of the transmitted color. So think of the color wheel. The, the complement is the color on the opposite side in any one time of the color wheel. So if the, if the glass, if you see cyan in transmitted light, the complement of that is a sort of copper color and that'll be the reflected color. But as the angle of incidence changes or your angle of viewing changes, you get a color shift around the color wheel. So that, that accounts for the fact that there, there are different hues that are perceived both in transmitted and in reflected light. Are you thoroughly confused? No, I kind of followed you, but that sounds like a lot of color and a lot of light, Ed. Uh, although it helps to explain the phenomenon. So, you know, uh, going through a lot of airports, you're, you know, you're going up the escalator and I got my bag and every time I do that, it, here in Wichita, Ed, I, I look up and see your work and the, the mutability, the changeability of all that glass and the color that's going through it, I think you just gave me the explanation for kind of the physics of um, what I'm seeing, which is just spectacular. And it's got to be part of, um, in looking at the different projects that you shared with us, I, I think it's what helps your sculptures from day to night. Um, incredible large scale sculptures in really challenging um, locations within the crazy infrastructure of the airport or the road coming up to the airport. And yet, how do you make it large enough and then impressive enough? So you know, tell us about how you use color day and night to activate the sculpture that you place there? Um, you know, it's, I, I find color to be overused these days a lot. And be, because of course the RGB color, red, uh, green, blue color that you get so easily with, um, with LED lights can be combined into the most hideous brew of, of fruit cocktail colors that I that I really dislike and because they're uh, they're they're so overused and so I have resisted the uh, temptation to have a uh, color changing light in my sculptures although I did some of those 20 30 years ago um, before LEDs um, and generally I use white light um, and I uh, hope that the materials themselves uh, either have enough surface interest, as in the case with stainless steel, or with painted material, or with a glass, a dichroic glass, uh, potentially, so that colored light itself isn't necessary. Particularly with dichroic glass, you get the color shift that I was talking about. So from one side of a sculpture at a given time, it looks quite different than from the other side. And so that's by itself quite intriguing. And then of course, the day night difference is dramatic. And I don't try to duplicate at night what the sculpture looks like during the day. It's the complement of what it looks like the day. It's the analog. Um, and so and that gives it two distinct personalities. So wasn't intending to apply light. It's just the color ch shifts and changes that happen. So I've been hogging all the questions. Um, we don't have any questions from the chat. Any questions from the room? And I think you and I could go on and on and on with, I have a zillion million questions, but um, we here in Wichita have a special relationship with Jordan Snitzer. Uh -huh. And uh, we think your real estate, I think your real estate developer was not Jordan because that wasn't his building. That's correct. Well, he owns lots of buildings. He owns, <laughs> yeah, all up and down the, the West Coast. But uh, we have our trip committee chair here, Bud Gates, and we did a Portland trip um, seven, eight years or so ago. But I think you are giving us another reason to come back to Portland. Uh, you know, you, you at least are giving us a reason. You're giving us two reasons to come back to Portland. I want to see your bridge, and I want to go to Lake Oswego to see your other sculpture. And maybe between the time that we get organized to put this trip together, you'll give us a third reason 
and another sculpture yeah. to come see. Yeah. I'd love to do that. I've, I've got a bunch of other stuff around here that I didn't show you that, that we could uh, we could keep you busy for a while, but I would be delighted to lead a hike to the Wildwood Trail Bridge, the Barbara Walker Crossing. Um, and, and you can park at a place that's only a quarter mile away from it. So um, it's not hard to get to. to. Yeah, we're hardy adventures. Ed, this, this presentation was absolutely spectacular. We're so amazed with the work that you do. And we're so proud that we have one of yours here in Wichita. Thank you for joining us. Okay, all right, Sonia, who commissioned you for your sculpture, is now wanting to say, hey, Ed. Ed, thank you. Your presentation tonight was so inspirational. You've been busy. Your engineering feats, and I remember the day we installed a loft at the airport, and just, it's just a gift every time I come to the airport, so just hi, and thank you. <laughs> So, you know, thank you for reconnecting. Um, clearly, we need to come visit you, and clearly, we also need to invent another reason to entice you back to Wichita, not virtually, to come into the room and um, share time and hear, hear about all your amazing adventures. Thank you, Ed, for connecting tonight. And thank you, those people who are on Zoom. Ed, we're going to let you go off to your next thing. Thanks, thanks, thanks. My, my pleasure. Thank you all. For me. Wow. I think we could probably bring up, there he is. I think we can probably bring up the lights. Um, wow. You know, he's, I think I've been busy for the past six years. <laughs> Apparently not. Look at the, look at this fellow. Heaven forbid. Um, so we spent the year of the, uh, speakers um, in 2021 really anticipating the sculpture that's going to go right there. And in February, um, we constructed a ceiling that wasn't really equipped to hang a three-ton sculpture. So in February, we're, we're, let's just say we're doing some ret retrofitting. And then in March, Beth Lippman will be in town um, with the installation. And at the end of March, you will all be receiving an invitation, Murdoch Society and Board of Trustees only, to sort of have a toast to this next icon for this, the city of Wichita. And as you see, um, I, I've, been, I've, I've already been hard at work at Murdoch Mixology for next year. We have a great theme. I have one more speaker that... I'm kind of back and forth with trying to nail that person down. You will be receiving a brochure in um, January, mid-January, something like that. But please get this date on your calendar, which is February 17th for Tim Rogers, who comes, from, comes to us from New York City and the Museum of Art and Design. And next week is Turkey Week. Enjoy your turkey. And if you have family, you have kids or grandkids or... Uh, people in town, um, we know that uh, museum visitation is the highest ever in those days after Thanksgiving and then those days after Christmas. So we do something here called Winter Art Mania. Okay, it's a royal re. It's actually uh, Matt Buckingham, our curator of education, who's the ringleader for all that. So we have live music and a theater group and art making and all sorts of shenanigans throughout the building. So this, this place will be hopping Friday and Saturday after Thanksgiving, um, come back. Okay, one, one more promotion. I, um, I know a number of you are fans of Art Chatter. I don't know how many of you have ever come to our, to, to ELF which our contemporaries groups put together, which is an interacting, interactive uh, movie viewing situation for the Will Ferrell movie called Elf. And this year, I think it's December 9th. I go every year. I adore it. 
I, I, it is the one time of the year that I laugh the hardest. It is so much fun. There's such great energy in the room. So try it. We're all young at heart in the room. Thanks for coming. Thanks for the whole year. Thanks. Your Murdoch Society membership funds all of this that we bring to Wichita. Thank you.